this week? Anybody? <laughs> we have a couple people who confess. Okay, how many of you, whether you bought a Powerball ticket or not, dreamt about what you would do if you won the $1.5 billion? If you're not raising your hand right now, you're lying. Uh, <laughs> I was, just, I was just curious. Uh, let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much um, for this morning and just um, ha- the privilege that it is to gather together um, as your children, as a family, um, as your sons and daughters. And we thank you for that. We ask that you would speak to us now um, through your word. Lord, convict us, comfort us, um, teach us. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I guess because my parents uh, don't have all that much, and uh, I'm one of four kids, I never really thought that hard about the issue of inheritance. But several years ago, my grandmother and grandfather on my mom's side both passed away uh, within about a week of each other. And just eight months later, we were on our way to George's grandfather's funeral. In both cases, we were um, directly and indirectly involved in issues of inheritance. While wills tend to determine who gets um, whatever money is left over, there are a lot of other things to be worked out, from houses and cars to jewelry and tools and TVs, who gets what and how much and why. Sadly enough, in both situations, we also had caretakers who were stealing and lying, trying to get their hands on as much stuff as they could. It's situations like these that revolve around money and stuff that tend to be very revealing of where our hearts are. We find security and satisfaction in the things that we own and the amount of money that we have in our bank accounts. Any any chance to accumulate more, even the death of a family member, exposes the greed and insecurity in our hearts. And if you think that people fighting over dead people's stuff is a new thing, think again. (laughs) Uh, If you'll turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 2, I'm going to ask you to take out your Bibles or your smartphone um, or whatever it is. I'm not going to have the verses on the screen behind me this morning, so if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 13. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Let me just give you a little bit of background here. Jesus Um, is teaching a crowd of many thousands. Okay, this is at the peak of his ministry. There are thousands of people that have come from near and far to hear what he has to say. Read with me, starting in verse 13. Someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Friend, he said to him, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? See, Jesus has been talking to this crowd about issues of life and death. He tells them not to be afraid of death, but rather to fear God and know that God is the one who's caring for them. He's encouraging them to be bold in the face of persecution, and this man who's so self-centered, so concerned about his problem, his desire for his share of the inheritance, that he elbows his way up through the crowd of thousands of people and interrupts Jesus with a demand. He blurts out, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. This man has guts. He demands that Jesus set his brother straight. And in short, Jesus says no and then redirects the conversation in a way that addresses the man's true need. In verse 15, Jesus answers the man, 
by speaking to the entire crowd. Verse 15, he then told them, the whole crowd, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. This man thought he needed his share of the inheritance. But Jesus says, no, what you need first and foremost is a change of heart. Watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus brings the conversation back around to life and death and he urges us or he urges his listeners and by extension us to consider the question, what gives you life? Where do you find your security, your hope, your joy? What gives you life? And Jesus goes on to do what he does best. He tells a story, right? And we're going to start in verse 16. He then told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. So we're introduced to a man who's already rich, and then his land produces a larger than normal crop, which basically means a wealthy man became an even more wealthy man, okay? Because crops at the time equaled money and wealth. Notice that it is the land that produces the crops, not the man himself. In other words, his wealth was a gift from God. And as an audience, when we hear this, we should be wondering, what is he going to do with it? Thankfully, we find out in verse 17, he thought to himself, self, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? Well, that's not exactly true, we'll find out. But in other words, he has so much grain, he has nowhere to put it all. What a problem to have. (laughs) What is he going to do with the wealth that God has given him? And this is the key question. How he answers it will give us a window into his heart. Does he seek counsel from God or others? Does he share the excess with the poor or even his friends? Here's the solution he comes up with, starting in verse 18. I will do this, he said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, self, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, enjoy yourself. (laughs) He decides to set himself up for early retirement. He no longer needs to be concerned about the future. He's set for life. This is the American dream, isn't it? To accumulate enough wealth that eventually we can take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy ourselves. How many of us bought Powerball tickets again? (laughs) We all saw and to some degree were a part of the Powerball frenzy this week. But evidently that dream isn't as American as we think it is. Maybe it's just human. So this man has a problem, too much stuff. And the solution he comes with, up with is to take the barns that he already has, tear them down, and build bigger ones so he has room for all his stuff. Seems sensible enough, right? wise even. You wouldn't want that stuff to go to waste. And then God inserts himself into the conversation that thus far this man has only been having with himself. Read with me in verse 20. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you. And the things you have prepared Whose will they be? That is how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich 
toward God. Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool says in his heart, God does not exist. A woman named Mary Orr, when she was writing about this passage, says this, The rich fool is not a fool because he is rich, but because he trusts his riches instead of trusting God. He has not taken God into account in his plan for the storage and disposition of his goods. He assumes that they are his alone to do with as he wishes. And it is this arrogant attitude, this functional atheism, that God objects to in the story. You see, he may or may not profess to believe in God, but his relationship with his possessions exposes the true state of his heart. When answering the question of what to do with the wealth that God has given him, he focuses entirely on himself. He takes no account of others and no account of God. Instead, we see the word I six times and my five times in just three verses. Not to mention the fact that he's literally speaking to himself. He thinks that his wealth and his life are his own, to control and do with as he pleases. But in reality, it was never his to begin with. And ironically, although he is prepared physically for many years, those many years never come. And he is not prepared spiritually for life after death. In the process of striving to secure his future, he loses everything. In this life and presumably the life to come because he is not rich toward God. So now what? Is the moral of the story simply, you can't take it with you? While this is true, I think death exposes the basic poverty of all of our lives. I think there's something much deeper going on here. Let's go back to what I believe is the core question that Jesus is addressing here. What gives you life? Where do you find your security, your hope, your joy? The first answer to this question is found back in verse 15, when Jesus says to the crowds, Watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Possessions can't and don't give life. And I mean life in every sense of the word. Possessions can't secure your physical life. We see this in the parable. This man was filthy rich, and yet that very night, he died. No amount of money could buy his life back. And possessions can't secure your eternal life either. God is not impressed by the amount of stuff or money that we manage to accumulate. In fact, what we see throughout Scripture is often the exact opposite, that possessions tend to be obstacles to eternal life. Jesus himself says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why do we all want to be rich again? And in the same way that possessions can be obstacles to eternal life, they can also be obstacles to the abundant life that Jesus offers us here and now. When we place our trust in possessions, they don't give life. They take it. And the point here is not that wealth is bad, but that it is fraud. The point is not that wealth is bad, but that it is fraud. You see, it promises life, security, and happiness. But there's never enough, and the pursuit of it eventually consumes us. Instead of bringing security, we find that the more we have, the more we want, and the harder we have to work to keep it. We are filled with angst, clinging to the gifts that God has given us, overcome with fear that we will lose them. 
Randy Alcorn gives what I find to be a really helpful illustration here. He says, the more things we own, the greater their total mass, the more they grip us, hold us, and set us in orbit around them. Finally, like a black hole, a gargantuan cosmic vacuum cleaner, they mercilessly suck us into themselves until we become indistinguishable from our things, surrendering ourselves to the inhuman gods we have idolized. In short, we become slaves to our possessions. And the things we own or wish we owned dictate our everyday actions and attitudes. Not exactly a picture of the abundant life that Jesus offers, is it? So if we don't believe that possessions give us life, then what? How does this work itself out in a practical way in our lives, right? Because what we believe translates into action. And if we believe that possessions give us life, that will work its way out in the form of greed in our lives. This is why Jesus says we must watch out and be on guard against all greed. What is greed? Greed is the desire and lust for more and more. There's an insatiable quality to greed. It is never satisfied. Greed often arises out of fear and insecurity, out of a mindset of lack or of pleasure seeking. It's an indicator that we believe that possessions give us life in one form or another. Now, before you write me off because you don't lay awake at night dreaming about becoming a millionaire, except for this past week, um, there's a reason that Jesus says, watch out, be on guard. Because greed can manifest itself in very subtle and subversive ways. There are two main manifestations of greed, one of which is covetousness, wanting what you don't have, the passion to possess what God has not given you. Now, we may be pretty good at keeping ourselves from coveting the nice car or the big house, but could your daily discontent be a sign of subtle greed? Listen to this quote from Lynn Twist. For me and for many of us, our first waking thought of the day is, I didn't get enough sleep. It's me. The next one is, I don't have enough time. Once again, it's me. Um, whether true or not, that thought, not enough, occurs to us automatically before we even think to question or examine it. We spend most of the hours and days of our lives hearing, explaining, complaining, or worrying about what we don't have enough of. Before we even sit up in bed, before our feet touch the floor, we're already inadequate already behind, already losing, already lacking something. And by the time we go to bed at night, our minds are racing with a litany of what we didn't get or didn't get done that day. And we go to sleep burdened by those thoughts and wake up to that reverie of lack. This internal condition of scarcity, this mindset of scarcity lives at the very heart of our jealousies, our greed our prejudice, and our arguments with life. Do you live with a mindset of scarcity? Are you constantly thinking about what you don't have, regardless of how big or small, how tangible or intangible? Watch out. This is a subtle way that greed can infiltrate your life. And another manifestation of greed, this is where I really tend to struggle is possessiveness. Clinging tightly, selfishly to what we do have. Whether it's a lot or a little, it doesn't matter how much we have, we cling to it. This is what we see clearly in the parable. The man takes everything that God has given him and hoards it 
for himself. I'm not just talking about, you know, the hoarding TV show. You know, if you don't have stacks of newspapers in your house, that doesn't mean you aren't a hoarder, <laughs> okay? Hoarding is a means of replacing God, and when we hoard, we assert our self-sufficiency and independence. It's usually born out of fear, fear of future unknowns. We have to be prepared, right? Financially or otherwise, for whatever may happen. We need every kind of insurance. We need the IRS, or not the 401k. <laughs> um, all of these things, right? This is like, if you watch commercials these days, like every other one is some way that we can make our lives safer, that we can be more prepared for anything that might possibly happen in the future. Okay? But here's the truth. When I hoard, I'm unwilling to part with what I've saved to meet others' needs because my possible future needs outweigh their actual present needs. Let me say that again. When we hoard, we are unwilling to part with what we've saved to meet others' needs because our possible future needs outweigh someone else's actual present needs. Hoarding and possessiveness can also be born out of simple selfishness. I want what little I feel like I have for myself. I deserve to reap the benefits of my hard work, right? What it comes down to is whether we view the money and things we have as our own or as God's. If we store up treasure for ourselves, no matter how enticing it may be, we are fools. And if we spend our lives pining after what we do not have, we are fools. And so far, I've told you what not to do, be greedy, right? And what not to believe, that possessions give you life. But we can't just stop believing something. We have to replace that belief with another, with the truth, right? And so we return to the question, what gives you life? We know that possessions don't give you life, but what does? Jesus answers, trust in God. The only source of true life, security, hope, and joy is a trusting relationship with God. God gives us every physical breath we take. And when we trust in him, our life has meaning and purpose and every real need is met. Eternal life comes only through trust in Jesus as our Savior. And trust in God gives us life and frees us from the anxiety that comes with trusting things that aren't actually trustworthy, like money and possessions. To be rich toward God is to trust him and live your life in light of that trusting relationship. And our trust in God should affect every area of our lives, including how we view and handle our money and our possessions. Jesus shows us what true life looks like in the verses that follow the parable. I found that often these passages are preached separately as, you know, kind of their own things, but they actually are very connected. Jesus is answering this question, what gives you life? Okay? Uh, read with me, beginning in verse 22. We're in Luke 12, chapter, chapter 12, verse 22. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore, therefore, in other words, this is connected to what was before, right? So therefore, because possessions can't give you life, because storing up treasure for yourself is worthless and foolish, because everything you have is a gift from God, he says, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about the body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Once again, Jesus is reiterating, your life doesn't consist of what you own. He goes on, he says, consider the ravens, your type of bird. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a storeroom or a barn, yet God feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than the birds? 
When our security is found in the amount of money we have in the bank account, we will always be anxious, wondering if we have enough. But if our security is found in God, we have no need to worry, knowing that if God feeds even the birds, he will surely take care of us. But that's not enough evidence. Jesus goes on in verse 25. He says, Can any of you add a span to his age by worrying? If you're not able to do even a little thing like this, why worry about the rest? Jesus is being very practical here. How many of you can add a second to your life? No, none of you? You can't add a, not a single second, just one. One second. Okay, just, just making sure. I can't either. So if we can't do even that, right, what do we hope to accomplish by worrying? This can be a hard thing to acknowledge, but it's true. We're completely out of control. And any one of us could drop dead any moment with a brain, brain aneurysm. I'm not saying that to make you worry, just the opposite, okay? Hopefully, when we realize how foolish our worrying is, and not only that, but often sinful because it's born out of our greed and idolatry, our trust in ourselves and our things instead of God, we will be able to repent and trust God, knowing that he loves us and is in complete control. But Jesus isn't done yet. If you aren't convinced yet, he goes on in verse 27. Consider how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass, which is in the field today and is thrown in the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he do for you, you of little faith? Don't keep striving for what you should eat and what you should drink, and don't be anxious. For the Gentile world eagerly seeks all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Take a chill pill. I know my husband's laughing at me at this point because I really struggle in this area. <laughs> uh, stop striving after the same things as those who have no faith. We live our lives the same way as people who don't know God. We're worried about the same things as people who don't know God. Why? Trust in God changes everything. Finally, read with me in verse 31. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old. An inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. You don't need a lawyer to protect your heavenly assets. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, our relationship with our possessions is a window into the state of our hearts. How we handle what God has given us reveals where we truly place our trust, no matter what we say with our mouths. Trust in possessions yields anxiety and greed. Trust in God yields generosity in all areas of life. Trust in possessions yields anxiety and greed. Trust in God yields generosity in all areas of life. There's an acronym that became popular several years ago that I think people still use today. Um, it's YOLO. Who knows, what does that mean? Somebody? You only live once, right? And I believe that this perfectly encapsulates the attitude of the world around us right now, right? We're frantically trying to do everything you can to secure the one life you have. Accumulate as much as possible so that you can enjoy life to the fullest. This is a life driven by anxiety. What if I fail in this life to be happy, to have everything I want? And it's driven by greed. Everything is about me and what I have. I have to look out for myself. 
You only have one life, so you better live it for yourself and not waste anything on anybody else. My dad is kind of a stickler about these things. He likes to comment on current culture. And he um, didn't like the YOLO uh, term, so he came up with a new acronym in response, all in good fun, but I think it fits the mindset, the way of life that is trusting God. And it's YALT. You actually live twice. We have a heavenly Father who loves us and is caring for us here in this life and is waiting to receive us into his kingdom in the next. You see, we can be generous with everything that God has given us, our money, our food, our clothes, our time, our relationships, everything, knowing that, one, we are storing up treasure in heaven where it will count for eternity. And two, our lives don't depend on these things anyway. God is the one who gives us life and everything we have in this life so we can use our resources in whatever way God calls us to without fear and with great joy. I think 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19 sums up this entire long passage really beautifully. Paul says, Instruct those who are rich in the present age, that's us, not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good reserve for the age to come, so that they may take hold of life that is real. My prayer for all of us in this room is that we would take hold of life that is real. As we transition into a time of communion, I challenge you to take some time pondering this question. What gives you life? What is your life currently orbiting around? What thing or relationship or circumstance are you pining for that you think will finally make you happy or content? What do you spend your time and energy trying to protect? What are you worried about losing? And where is the Holy Spirit calling you to be radically generous? As we take communion, we declare that Jesus is the one who gives us life. We remember and thank him for his sacrifice on the cross, which bought us abundant life here on earth and eternal life in heaven with him. Inga's going to come up and play a song. I invite you to take some time in reflection, and when you're ready, come up and just take one of the pieces of bread dip it in the, in the juice, <laughs> and, um, and you can eat it right up here, and Sam will come up and pray for us afterwards. Jesus, reveal the idols in our hearts. Reveal our lack of trust, our unbelief. We confess our greed, our anxiety, our stinginess, our unbelief. These things are not from you. Give us the abundant life that can only be found through trust in you. Amen.